Okay, so we are going to put up a list of questions that um, Dr. Blackstone and I oops, uh, put together from all of the conversations that we've had over the past couple of days. And as you can see, there's quite a lot of them. So many of you are hoping that um, mainly Dr. Blackstone, but myself included, uh, might provide some answers to these questions. But that's not the case. Uh, but what we will provide is maybe an overview of some of the data that we could collect in an effort to try to at least address some of these questions. So this is just a slide to show what's out there in terms of surgical uh, series. And as you can see, they're generally small numbers. They're variable. So the bottom line, as I mentioned, there are many unanswered questions. One of the things that uh, Jean and I discussed is whether in an effort to investigate these questions, we could look at analogous data sets and extrapolate some of the information that may be similar among these related populations. One of these is obviously the group of patients with detransposition undergoing atrial switches. But the other one that we've talked about at the CHSS over the years is a compilation of the Fontan populations in the CHSS cohort may be combined with the Australian data. And I know that Dr. McCrindle um, has had some discussions with Dr. Dudekum about uh, combining these populations, which may help us understand what we seem to be seeing as a theme that are the potentially advantaged outcomes of Fontans in CCTGA. This is just a flow chart to show that it's complex, and I don't want to show too much of that data because we're hoping to show it at the AATS at the Centennial. So now we get down to it. Yes. So um, this is a um, depiction of many of the different strategies that are leveraged in the treatment of patients with CCTGA. And Jean and I are in some ways going to deconstruct each one of these and talk about some of the data that we might need to address the questions that I opened with. So first is the non-surgical therapy. Yes, so let me ask some questions about the data here. Um, we heard that uh, neonatal diagnosis is possible. Um, there was a suggestion, and I looked it up today in the fourth edition of cardiac surgery, and that is a suggestion um, of actually beginning treatment of these babies neonatally before the LV involutes with the possibility of putting on uh, a band so that there is no devolution of the left ventricle because there's a little bit of data. I don't know how strong that data you folks think it is that the trained left ventricle is not quite the same strength as the, in the long term as the left ventricle before it had uh, had the um, involution. Um, so what do you think about the possibility that even if you have, um, you know, no associated defects, um, what about uh, PA band? Um, and, you know, that'll lead into some of these other things. What is the excuse for ever doing a double switch and this sort of thing that we'll get into? Right. So I think the first question is, is there ever a, an imperative um, for an anatomic repair? For any kind of, uh, you know, at, in the neonate with CCTGA. And I think that this is a question that is highly complex that reflects the nature of the population. Obviously, there are several, I think, hierarchical questions um, that we could address. One is, uh, was raised by Dr. Friedman, which is the neurodevelopmental outcomes of patients. Is a child who you subject to a PA band who is vulnerable or maybe preterm, which may in some ways lead you away from <coughs> primary anatomic repair, is that infant then subjected to some hypoxemia or hypoxia as a result of your banding that may somehow impair their later development? Clearly, to answer those questions, we would need long-term and regular surveillance of the neurodevelopmental outcomes in these babies, whether it be by Bailey scales or, as we are doing at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, 
dedicated EEG with a control population, not only of normal children, but also children with not as complex congenital heart disease. So I think that's the first question. So let me follow up on that. Yeah. Um, you talked about analogies, and I agree with that idea of trying to find, for rare diseases, trying to find some analogies, especially when you have treatment that are sort of the same final common pathways. But, but I think the, um, the analogy to the infant with DTGA and the desaturation and this sort of thing on neurodevelopment, I'm not sure that's really analogous in that many of these patients, uh, these patients don't tend, unless they have pulmonary stenosis, to be um, desaturated. Um, he says ischemic. I don't agree with that word. I think it's, it's really talking about oxygen. Um, so is there a really good analogy for the neurodevelopment, and is there data on neurodevelopment? We're talking about do we have the right data, do we have adequate data? You know, I think, I'm not sure that we have much data on the CCTGA patient and their neurodevelopment. Does anyone know of any? Do you uh, know? Yeah, I think that we have very limited data. I think some of the questions, and I'm just going to digress for a moment to go back to even the very basic question, which what is the entire population of patients that we are discussing in this conference? Dr. Anderson isn't here, so um, I'm going to um, use the term L transposition because in our Cleveland Clinic experience, we actually have children who have tricuspid atresia with L transposed arteries. And so many of those patients, if they have aortic arch anomalies, would potentially have flow related disturbances in the development of their. Um, their neurodevelopment. So there may be some analogies in certain discrete populations to patients that we have some data about neurodevelopment, and those are the patients with hypoplastic left heart and its related anomalies. However, I agree with you that a child with detransposition who requires an atrial septostomy in the early going and is cyanotic may be quite divergent from a child with congenitally corrected transposition who in the absence of pulmonary stenosis or outflow tract obstruction may actually not be um, vulnerable in quite the same way. I want to mention before I forget, because this is a very extemporaneous thing that Dr. Blackstone and I are doing here, so prone to forget things that I don't write down. If you look at the genetic literature for analogous patients with DTGA, uh, we know that there is a genetic inheritance in congenital heart disease, but what's quite fascinating is that babies with CCTGA actually have a slightly higher incidence of the development of other transposition anomalies in probands that are followed, even in where you have the same prevalence of consanguinity. And what's fascinating is that many of these babies who develop CCTGA actually come from parents with DTGA, suggesting that there may be a pathogenetic link between both detransposition and congenitally corrected transposition. Getting back to your question about neurodevelopment, the final thing is that clearly CCTGA cohorts with laterality defects. We know that there is association between CCTGA and heterotaxy. And obviously, there are some genes that are um, characterized for heterotaxy. One of them is cryptic. There is a SMA, SMA gene, which is uh, cohorts with heterotaxy. So I think genetic and epigenetic information clearly will be needed. And this is some data that we can collect from biomarker studies, from pooled studies, um, and clearly um, the impetus for whole exome and genome sequencing in these patients. So since you've gotten a sidetracked into genetics and epigenetics and biomarkers, uh, let's switch a little bit to the double switch. All right. Um, in, and yesterday, there was a fair amount of information given to us about the LV training and so on and so forth. What, what we know from at least the experience here is that a number of these patients that were banded actually have gone, went on to transplantation before they had um, 
um, a, a, the double switch. And I wonder if there's any way, in terms of data, uh, is there data that could be gathered to know either ahead of time or during the retraining of the left ventricle that this patient is going to fail or not? Um, you don't want to take them through all sorts of stuff if there is some kind of marker, genetic marker, what have you, that they um, are not trainable. Um, yeah, so that's another um, great genre of questions. Um, I think that the assessing the adequacy and really the physiologic um, eligibility for being a good candidate for a double switch is one of the most important questions that we face, and that has been a big topic of conversation at this summit. I think in order to understand that question, obviously it is, uh, would require very granular data that's collected over um, the lifetime of the patient. So many, if you look at Roger Mee's initial data and many other series with anatomic repair, the immediate results are actually quite good. Um, however, if you look at the trajectory of many of those patients, and our particular series here at the clinic shows that there is a decrement which may start around eight years. So I think that we need long-term serial data. I think MRI could be leveraged to look at some of these repairs, maybe some form of 4D, a CT or MR, where we could look at some computational fluid and how these ventricles respond. I thought the discussion about circumferential contraction and the um, notion of spiral fibers and the, the real difference between the um, muscular phenotype of the RV and the LV is a fascinating area of study. And actually, I found some articles late last night um, after several cocktails that um, demonstrated that um, you can actually uh, see uh, the differences between these fibers uh, in MR. So uh, I think that is one of the areas that we need to focus on is uh, assessing serial data over the lifetime of these patients, Gene. Now, speaking of LV training, um, there are in this audience some younger folks. So let me bring up a, a nasty subject. And that is, in 1990, when Abawi suggested and, and first published about this double switch, it was at an interesting time in history. First of all, the arterial switch, by, the, by 1990, um, people were getting reasonable results. Um, it had been in Europe for a while. Um, it was... Um, you know, at least five years or so into uh, that in the United States. It was also the peak of knowledge and skills of doing sennings, mustards, uh, some even bidirectional glands are doing that. But um, how, how many mustards or sennings have you done so far in your young life? One. Um, uh, how many folks whose training has been since 1990, how many have done a sending or a mustard? One, two, three, four. Um, I think that, uh, I, I wonder whether or not um, all, all the meticulous ways of trying to avoid baffle obstruction and all this, I wonder if that might be a lost art in terms of doing, say, a double switch. I wonder if, if we have training for that. Yeah, I think that's a terrific question, and it gets into what um, Emil was talking about yesterday, that many of the results of um, anatomic repair and, I dare say, any complex repair that are achieved at high volume centers. And I'm going to use volume, although it's an imperfect metric of performance. Um, but it is a metric that we can measure uh, objectively. Many of the results that we obtain at these centers may not be achievable at other centers. So I think we have to bear that in mind and be quite circumspect about how we generalize the potential benefit of these complex repairs across the spectrum 
of healthcare delivery and congenital heart surgery, which we know is um, highly variable. So I think that is a great point. I think that training um, of these lesions is perhaps in some ways historic now, although um, you know, we do um, get exposed to some of these, but you may see one or maybe two. I think I was at the University of Michigan, so I saw potentially more than some, but, um, but very rare. So let me now do a double switch away to, um, to Tess here, and that is, can, can we talk a little bit about the arrhythmias? So the arrhythmias may be next to inevitable in this. Um, in terms of do we have the data, um, one of the problems is that we periodically follow these patients. We were told yesterday we should be following them more often. What about following them all the time? I wonder if, if in a lesion like this, is it, um, is it beginning to come time for wearables? So that, so that these kids, I mean, you know, they, they wear rubber bands around their wrists. They do all <laughs> sorts of little things. Um, for monitoring their atria, uh, I think you could make a, um, you know, a medical plea for, uh, for continuously monitoring uh, the rhythm in these kids. And it would do a couple of things. First of all, the real problem here is long-term follow-up. These folks need to be followed for life, you know. And there's so many barriers to following patients and getting their data. But wearables would be a wonderful way of constantly tracking where they are. We can find out if they're going out with the wrong guy. We can find out if they're speeding in their car. But mainly, we can find out if they um, are developing some of these rhythms. And some of these devices um, may well be able to e even tell us if the QRS is becoming more prolonged, not just atrial arrhythmias and the like. Um, so I wonder if, you know, it's, it's a big data question for kids like this um, that could be, you know, wearables. What do you think, Tess? Absolutely rapidly. Yeah, so, so there, or so, both. Yeah, so there is an ACC um, committee, as you know, and uh, you may be on it, um, that, you know, is partnering with the um, Cardiothoracic Surgical Network in, in really looking seriously at at wearables and the upcoming trial that is being approved and will start hmm, sometime, um, should have been started by now, it'll probably be sometime in November, will actually be a subset of patients that will have um, long-term wearables. By long-term, they're, they're going to support it for a year. But I, I think that might be um, a way of of getting more data about how these patients are doing um, without the barriers we currently have uh, and also with the transition of care. Um, I think the teenagers to the 20s, you know, where we lose so many of these patients to follow up and the like, if they were wearing, you know, <laughs> a watch, um, this might be an interesting way of getting more data. No, I think it's a great point. I think this slide highlights uh, what I'm terming the badness of follow-up in this population, which is the Achilles heel of understanding outcomes in this population. Um, any talk about wearables, I'm all in with that. Um, frequent surveillance, clearly, home monitoring-esque type programs. Obviously, the work by Nancy Ganiam and her colleagues popularized this in single ventricle management. It's, there's no reason why it could not be extended to complex patients with CCTGA who arguably are at risk for sudden death by virtue of arrhythmias uh, and banded babies um, also. 
uh, the whole the transition care uh, I think is a, a, a critical issue. Um, there's a highly variable age of presentation for this population, um, which, you know, is there some selection bias or lead time bias, uh, which may always in some ways disadvantage our perspective on anatomic repair or repair patients who require early intervention as opposed to those with potentially good RVs uh, that may last until their 40s before they come to medical attention. And with that, I think it is time for us to quit, even though in you know the two or three sessions we've had together, we've ended up with a half hour of questions and different questions. But um, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of things we don't know about these patients, and um, and we're frustrated with the way that we're currently gathering data, and and there may be some solutions for the future. Multi-institutional study. That's yes. what I would advocate for. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.